I'm at the ETEL conference speaking with Jason Miller, the Chief Commerce Strategist at uh, Akamai Technologies. How are you today, Jason? Good. How are you? Great. Thank you. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Um, uh, most people know who Akamai is, so probably not a big intro needed on that end. Uh, what's new with Akamai? Well, at Akamai, we're always innovating. And some of the new things we've done here recently is we've released a new version of our Akamai Ion, which has a lot of cellular optimizations, optimizations for adaptive content delivery, and actually things like prefetching and the ability to push content to end users, as well as a mobile SDK. Okay, so who are the main customers? So we're here at the, a, a retailer conference. Uh, are pretty much like all the top retailers your customers and using this product? We do have a lot of the top 100 retailers on the IR list. I think the number is like 96 right now are our customers, and there are a lot of them using all the different products we have. Okay. And uh, what about going downstream? Do you also work with smaller companies? How, how small of a uh, retailer do you work with? Uh, well, we, we can work with retailers of all sorts of sizes. Um, I would say we have them all the way from, like you said, the top tier, right. you know, all the way down to new startups and things like that. So it really depends on how much they value customer experience, the ability to offload uh, their infrastructure and performance. Right. Uh, what about the, some other products like you also mentioned, like Image Manager? What is that? Yeah, we just recently in September, we re released Image Manager. And what it does is it takes your digital asset management process and offloads that to Akamai's infrastructure. So, for example, when you want to have a responsive website and you want to send uh, your large 2 meg hero image to a phone, well, it's going to get resized in responsive design. It's going to get fluid re resized, but it's still the same size. So that image takes 2 megs of download on a phone when they only see it at a postage stamp size. So what you can do with our image manager product is you can actually have, through business rules, that image would automatically be resized by our edge servers and the right sized image served to the phone. So it's a huge savings in image bytes and downloads, so it increases performance. But what we can also do there is automatically, in the background, we know what kind of device you're on and what kind of browser you're using. We can actually serve the actual proper type of image. So for example, uh, with Chrome browser, we can serve a WebP file, which is also a huge savings in performance without any visual loss in quality of the image. Okay. so. Traditionally, companies have used other third-party image processing sites to do this. So now they can actually do it with Akamai uh, or Akamai. Uh, and is there an advantage to use Akamai for multiple services? Yeah, because you're going to get just that performance and scale of you know our massively distributed network across the whole world, the goal always being to be within one hop of an end user. Um, and when we talk about image management, Specifically, one of the things there is if you tried to make all the different variants for all the different phones and tablets and, uh, and your desktop size, you end up with lots and lots of variants. I, I have a slide that I talk to this where it's really like one image becomes 128 different sized images if you're going to serve it to all the proper sizes and the proper formats for the different browsers. So through our image management process, a customer of ours only has to have one pristine image in one format. And we will take that and dynamically create all the other sizes as they're needed by the different types of devices based on their business rules. So it offloads a big portion of that you know, digital asset management process and also storing all those variants. You'd have a huge storage need to make all these different variants if you had to do that for every product. And really, if you want to do responsive design right, you have to have an image management solution or you're sending a lot of unnecessary bytes to the end user every time they request that big hero image. Right, definitely. Um, and I mean, th the concept of the one hop is critical. It, it just makes all the difference. I just say from my own experience, it makes a big difference. So the fact that Ak Akamai is already doing that as far as the, uh, the, the web itself, the site itself, and being able to just add the image to that same infrastructure, the same system, I think it makes sense to, you know, I would feel comfortable saying that they, they're going to do a good job. Yeah, and you're offloading all that traffic off your whatever your hosting or infrastructure right. is because we're going to cache that image now at the edge nearest the customer where it's quicker for them to download and where you're not having to store that and keep transmitting that back and forth to the different end users. Right. 
What about video? Uh, so our image manager product doesn't actually change video, but we do have an entire uh, media side of Akamai, which is focused on OTT video and optimizations specifically for video. So tell me about this. Uh, you also mentioned something like a, called a bot manager. What is a bot manager? Yeah, so we have a bot management product and what a lot of retailers don't even realize till they really start monitoring their traffic is a lot of sites are having between 40 and 50% of the traffic is all bot generated non-human traffic. So some of that traffic is good traffic, you need it, like Google search bot indexing your site, or maybe partner websites that need to scrape you for different reasons, you know, for, so you show up in their search results. But then there's more nefarious things where people are trying to steal your content or your competitors are trying to price match you and all these other scenarios that, that are using up resources when they don't need to. So rather than just trying to block all the bots to begin with, uh, we actually take more of a management approach and we say, depending on what kind of bot it is, we're gonna do, we're gonna treat it differently. Um, so for instance, in travel, especially like airlines, um, they need to show up in travel search engines and the travel search engines are using bots to go get the pricing and stuff like that. But what happens is on the back end for the airline, they're paying Amadeus or Sabre or someone for every one of those queries. And oftentimes those queries are coming at a velocity that's unnecessarily high because the you don't need a new price for the flight every five seconds. Um, so in that scenario, what we've done is we've started caching those queries based on business logic in the back end so that the bot can still get the information it needs to have them show up in the search results. But the, the airline is not paying all this extra traffic and queries on the back end. Right, so I, I think I heard a number uh, uh, last year sometime that over half of the traffic on a lot of websites is just bots or spiders. Yeah, and we see that across a lot of different verticals. Um, I obviously focus on the commerce and travel, and we definitely see it. And it's even higher when you get into travel than it is even on retail. So it can be a really large number. So being able to manage that so you're not wasting resources and mm -hmm. still give them whatever is necessary in the in the example of you know returning a price for a fare you know on an airline or something. And there's also kind of the flip side of that is there are bots that are scraping you for things that you don't want them to. Um, so we have the ability to actually send them to a whole different page, give them different content. Um, or for example, if you're getting scraped for prices from a competitor, you can actually give them different pricing when they scrape you for pricing. This is almost like, uh, you know, for, um, for email servers, they have blacklists. You almost have like a blacklist of bots. Is that, you know? We do have a really large list categorized of different types of bots that we can identify. Based on IP? Or, uh, IP's, yeah. only, IP's only part of it, okay. especially since the IP can change. Right. Um, there's a lot more that goes into the, you okay. know, how the request looks, you know, what headers they pass or don't pass, okay. and how we handle them. And um, it's up to the retailer how they want to, you know, what if they want to, like, tar pit them or if they want to give them different content. That's all stuff they can configure depending on what type of bot it's categorized as. Okay, that's very interesting because uh, so one of the common things in, in retail and commerce is the uh, fact that you can do um, price, price matching and that's like they do that using uh, spiders and bots. So you can actually prevent, you can send them to a different page that has different pricing. Yeah, you could return totally different pricing to the price scraping bots and just make it where they're getting say msrp pricing all the time you know and you still have your regular pricing for your customers that is an amazing service in and of itself so <laughs> interesting so it's i mean maybe maybe people don't talk about it because i haven't heard of it before so i this is very interesting yeah our bot management product's pretty new um that was just oh, released last okay. year okay okay yeah. okay so, cool now you also mentioned something about ddos attacks uh, and a, 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 an acquisition that was made that actually provides that capability? Yeah, so we have two different products. Um, one is our Conus Site Defender product, which is security, web application firewall, and that is used to protect our customers from all sorts of you know script attacks and things like that across the web. But we did acquire a company called Prolexic a couple of years back, and what it is, is actually DDoS scrubbing centers. So what you see happening now, and I'm not sure if you're familiar recently, there was the Mira botnet. So essentially the Mira botnet is a bunch of compromised um, IoT devices, video cameras, DVRs right. and things. And 
they're able to take massive amounts of traffic, junk traffic, and throw it at a site to try to take it down. And then they usually are trying to extort the website for Bitcoin or something of that nature. Um, so in those scenarios, we can actually absorb all that traffic through our servers, filter out that bad attack traffic, and still let regular traffic flow through to the, our customers' websites so that their customers aren't impacted. And it's one of those things that without the scale of what Akamai does and the, the distributed nature of our platform, it's really hard to stop these 600 gigabyte a second attacks because say you're in a, a, in a co-location or something, at that rate, if you're trying to stop it with a piece of hardware, for instance, a single point of failure, you're going to get impact the whole entire co-location. So they eventually have to black hole your traffic and shut your website down. Right. So that's one of the reasons that we protect our customers in this way so that they can stay up and running even when these guys are trying to, you know, denial of service or something like that. Okay. So you're focused on the commerce and retail, right? So you work with just pure play online e-commerce companies as well as omni-channel retailers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we work with the biggest brick and mortar retailers and the biggest e-commerce players as well. Um, so we're always trying to learn, you know, what's on their roadmap, where they're looking, what problems they're trying to solve so that we can actually help them solve those problems. Right, so that's my uh, lead into my next question is that what are some of the biggest problems that you see when you talk to customers? As far as, you know, let's say, let's talk about the brick and mortar retailers. I think, not that it's necessarily an Akamai specific problem, but I think the biggest problem you see with brick and mortar right now is trying to bridge the customer experience from digital to brick and mortar. Um, you see some, some brick and mortar right now is actually doing really well. They're growing, they're expanding, and I think those are the ones that have actually bridged that experience. You know, so if I, if I want to look on the website, I should be able to say buy online, pick up in store. I should be able to see inventory values. Um, I should have a similar experience and feeling when I'm browsing online is when I'm in the store. And the ones that are doing really well have, I think, kind of captured that connection to the customer experience. I think the ones that haven't, we see them closing down and <laughs> that sort of thing. Having uh, definitely challenges, which is interesting. I mean, some of the largest companies are really uh, going through uh, existential challenges right now. And uh, the uh, you know the the question is that sh are they going to survive or should they survive? You know if you don't ado adopt uh, or adapt to the changing environment to the changing consumer, should you really even be in the retail business? Yeah, I think if you don't innovate, it's the innovator die or die kind right, of a scenario. Right. Um, I mean, there there will always be malls and brick and mortar because people do like that tangible feeling of going shopping. And obviously right now, there's still a lot more money being spent on brick and mortar. It's just not growing at the same kind of rate as e-commerce. And e-commerce obviously eats into a little of that growth. But when we talk about, like there was a speaker earlier today uh, talking about how to compete with Amazon. And really, if you're competing with Amazon and you're a peer play, you're kind of at a disadvantage. If you have physical stores, you have an edge on what Amazon's doing because people can physically come in, touch and feel it. You can get the instant gratification of buy online, pick up and store. So I think there's an advantage to having brick and mortar, but I think it has to be done right. So the footprint has to, to, to match, you know, you can't have the, your, your store may not need to be five stories, you know, it may need to focus on, you know, here's the key things that people want to come into the store and pick up as compared to we want to carry every possible thing, like be Amazon is a digital, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, it is, it's probably impossible, I, I, if I could use that word, to really beat Amazon at its game right now for anybody, doesn't matter, you know, Walmart, Alibaba, I mean, you got to do something different because uh, Amazon is not innovating only in commerce. They're innovating in so many side and related services as well that I don't see anybody doing that. I, I see like people working on just the commerce part and trying to get that done. But then you've got drones, you've got you know, the, the, the cloud base. I mean, all of these different things actually help the commerce business of Amazon. So that, that's where I definitely agree that you need to do something that they can't do, which is the human, the proximity, 
factor and having the inventory close by, building a different relationship. And which is probably why Amazon is starting to open up stores. Yeah, their new grocery store in Seattle. I haven't got a yeah. chance to go see it personally, um, but that's a pretty interesting ability to go in there, put everything in your basket and just leave. And, <laughs> and you've paid, it's all automatic. So, right. and, and like you said, I think Amazon is, is innovating in so many different areas to keep their commerce competitive. They can keep the margins lower. You know, they've got their own supply chain. They've got their own plain delivery, system, distribution right. and everything. So it would be really hard to jump in there and, and compete with that. Although Walmart and Jet, they're making, a, making an trying. effort at it. Yes. Alibaba's coming in yes. and, and, and working at it. Um, Competition's good for him. It'll keep it everybody innovating, though. Definitely, so. definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jason.